Our first speaker today is Mark Fiji. He is a professor of history and the Wallace Stegner Chair in Western American Studies at Montana State University, which is in Bozeman, for those of you who don't know. Uh, he specializes in the American West, environmental history, the history of conservation, and the history of national parks, national forests, and other components of the U.S. public lands system. Uh, he's working on histories of greater Yellowstone and settler colonialism, as well as his projects on Ehlers Koch and a book entitled Wallace Stegner's Unsettled Country, colon, Ruin, Realism, and Possibility in the American West, uh, which is forthcoming in early 2024 through the University of Nebraska Press. A little promo for you there. And then a little personal note, uh, Mark Fiji is also the author of Irrigated Eden, which is one of the my favorite academic books uh, about irrigation and landscape change and rabbits in southern Idaho. So, uh, so you know, give a little round of applause here for Mark Fiji. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thanks to uh, Christine Brown and all the Montana Historical Society staff for uh, organizing this wonderful conference. Um, I really appreciate being here. Um, I think it's the first time I've presented anything at this conference, and it's wonderful to see so many people and see the connection that the Historical Society staff makes with uh, the public. I think it's really wonderful. Um, uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I thought Kirby Lambert's uh, address at breakfast was really wonderful, and he reminded us of something very important, which is that our objective as historians is to understand the past, less judge it as good or bad. Um, I heard a former student of mine, Kira Axline, uh, give a wonderful talk in the first session on dark history and dark tourism. And I think Kira did a, an excellent job of showing that there are darker sides um, to the Montana past that we're obligated to try to understand. I guess what I would add to what Kirby was saying and what Kira was saying is that the past always bears heavily upon the present. Um, the past has to mean something to us and it does mean something to us. And it, what it can mean to us can change over time. Um, the famous historian Frederick Jackson Turner once wrote that every generation rewrites its history according to the questions and concerns uppermost of, in its time. Um, and this is what happened with me and Ehlers Koch. I wasn't alone in this, but somehow Koch's story spoke to us in our current context of the 21st century. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this and present some thoughts to you, an overview of Koch's life, um, but also what he might mean for us now. So I first learned about Ehlers Koch um, through my colleague, Dr. Janet Orr, who also happens to be my wife. And she was doing a project with the US Forest Service on the Nine Mile Remount Depot um, uh, west of Missoula. And she published a wonderful article in the Montana Magazine of History on this. And in the course of this research, Janet came across this book by Ehlers Koch, 40 Years of Forester. And she asked me if I'd ever heard of this. And I said, no, I never heard of it. She said, you've got to read this. And I think in her mind, Ehlers is the kind of guy that she associates with, with her understanding of Montana culture and history. I think in her mind, Ehlers Koch fuses with the values that are expressed in the 1972 Montana Constitution and things like that. So Ehlers was Janet's man, and I had to read this book. And I read the book, and it's really interesting. And it's beautifully written. Um, and there are sides of Ehlers that really stand out. Um, one of the sides that stood out in this book, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, is that as a U.S. Forest Service ranger, he eventually dissented against the dominant trends in which his agency was headed. I also learned that Ehlers Koch was a graduate of the university where I teach now, Montana State University. Back then it was Montana State College, class of 1901. And Janet and I talked and we thought it would be really wonderful for MSU to recover a memory of Ehlers Koch, this legendary U.S. Forest Service ranger 
a distinguished alumnus that the university appeared to have forgotten. Now, it was about this time that um, the Ehlers Koch had a grandson, Peter Rutledge Koch. We knew about Peter Rutledge Koch. Um, 40 Years of, of, of a Forester was not published until 1998. Ehlers Koch died in 1954. Published in 1998, uh, types, designed and typeset by grandson, Peter Rutledge Koch. Jen and I wondered, who is this guy? Where is this guy? You know, um, can we talk to him? We didn't know Peter Koch. Um, around this time, our daughter also got her hands on a compilation of, I guess you'd call them underground journals that Peter Rutledge Koch published back in the 1970s in Missoula. It's called Montana Gothic. And you know how your, your those of you who are parents, how your children sometimes talk to you. And my daughter said, Dad, my version of American Western history, I get it from Peter Koch and Montana Gothic. You know, and this was not too long after her, she issued a series of challenges to me. One of them was, Dad, I'm stronger than you. <laughs> Dad, I'm legal. And then Dad, Mom wears the pants in this <laughs> So it's cool, you know, and and then and then what happened was uh, about this time, Peter Rutledge Koch asked a really well-known historian, Char Miller. Um, Char, is there anyone at Montana State University who might care about Ehlers Koch? And Char Miller said, "Yes, it's Mark Fiji." So I was happy to meet, um, make acquaintance with with. Peter Rutledge Koch. And one of the things he has done is to endow an annual lecture at both Montana State University and the University of Montana, the Ehlers Koch Lecture. So I gave the inaugural Ehlers Koch address. Um, this talk is a derivation of that. But that's some of the backstory of how um, I learned about Ehlers Koch. Ehlers Koch, uh, born in 1880. Graduated from Montana State College MSU in 1901. He went to Yale Forestry and got a master's degree in forestry. He went to work for Gifford Pinchot in the Bureau of Forestry. Gifford Pinchot in 1905 became the chief of the newly created U.S. Forest Service. Uh, Ehlers worked for Pinchot. Um, Ehlers surveyed many of the boundaries of forest reserves later renamed National Forest in 1907, around the Gallup Valley and other parts of the American West. Janet and I live in the Tobacco Root Mountains, Beaverhead Deer Lodge National Forest, and Ehlers, in another essay, says that he is the one who surveyed the forest boundaries in the Tobacco Root Mountains. We live in a little town called Pony, and almost certainly at some point, Ehlers came through Pony. Um, he went to work for the Forest Service, one of the first Pincho boys, as they were known, um, the first forest rangers. Um, he developed uh, some of the first infrastructure of, of Forest Service installations, trails, uh, communication systems, and so forth. Um, he established a nursery, Savanac Nursery, um, and so forth. Um, he was a firefighter. Um, and at some point by the 1920s, um, he began to doubt the agency mission. Um, and eventually in the 1930s, um, he spoke out against it. Um, and that's the high point of the story, the crux of the story, which I'll get to momentarily. What's really interesting about Koch, I think, Mueller's Koch is his background. It was an extraordinarily privileged background. Um, but that extraordinary and, and very privileged background established in him, inculcated in him, a set of values about what was right living and what was less um, than that. Um, he, he was born in Bozeman in 1880, and, that, and he grew up in the Gallup Valley at a really, really wonderful golden moment. Um, and it was his experience growing up that gave him the values, the standards that he thought the Forest Service and the modern world generally were violating and that prompted him to speak out. 
So to understand Koch and what he did in the 1930s, you have to understand a little bit about his upbringing. And the Gallup Valley was very different back then. Um, for starters, um, it was a time uh, after which um, Native Americans had been confined by the federal government to the reservations. Gallatin Valley in Bozeman was a remarkably prosperous place. Um, it was not the site of the kind of labor struggle and violence that you would see in, say, Butte or Missoula. Um, uh, Taylor Scotch's father, Peter Koch, was a banker. They were very affluent. They were white, of course, which meant a lot, you know, um, at that time and still does. Um, uh, he was one of the founders of Montana State University. So Ehlers Koch grew up in a world of remarkable um, privilege and also freedom. Um, Gallatin County back then, by the time he was getting into college and graduating, had 8,000 or 10,000 people, um, far, far, far less than the 125,000 that are now crowding into that county. That landscape that Ehlers Koch grew up in was remarkably open. It had not undergone what geographers call intensification, the building of fences, the building of houses, the building of pavement, the laying of pavement, the erection of fences, um, uh, uh, no trespassing signs, all the kinds of things, barbed wire, etc., cetera, um, that constrain movement. So Ehlers grew up um, with remarkable access to an open landscape, um, free of obstructions of all kinds, distant from sites of conflict and turmoil. He didn't grow up near in an Indian reservation where there, where there was ongoing violence against Native people, including the rape of women. He didn't see any of that. Remarkably privileged, open, free life. And that was what established his sense of right and what he felt was being violated later on. So you have to understand that, that early background, the privilege and, what, and um, how he saw it. Um, and he, he later wrote, and it was natural that I grew up with a love for the mountains and the range and the outdoor life. That picture right there, that's Gallatin Canyon. And if you've traveled up the Gallatin Canyon to Big Sky, you know how much that place has changed. You know how much that place now is not at all like what Ehlers Koch experienced. This wonderful privileged life and the joys that he experienced continued over into his early time in the U.S. Forest Service. Um, the early Forest Service, the Pinchot Boys, um, they had it really nice. Um, their job was to set up the early Forest Service installations, um, the, the, the ranger stations, communication systems, trails, and so forth. They spent a lot of time inspecting the national forests, and I wonder how much of that also was actually just kind of having a good time. You know? <laughs> For a guy who grew, who grew up riding horses, um, fishing, hunting, camping, all this kind of stuff, he had a, a wife, a Danish woman named Nerva, um, who was what you would call back then a new woman, very athletic, very outdoorsy, very well educated. She was his companion on a lot of the inspections that he did across national forests. Um, the historian Nancy Langston, she believes that the early Pinchot boys, and remember this is before the First World War. This is before the 1930s, it's before the Second World War, it's before the Cold War, it's before all of the really, really intense things that the Forest Service did to extract timber from the forest had happened. And she says that in those early days, the evidence suggests that the Pinchot boys approached the forests and their assignments with almost a wide-eyed sense of wonder. Their job was to figure out what was in those forests. Their job was not to superimpose upon the forest um, a, a, a plan for recreating them, re-engineering them. Their job was to figure out what was there. Um, so I, I think it was a pretty nice life. Um, this was Koch's early period in the Forest Service. He did a lot of other things. Um, outdoorsman. I wonder if my colleague, um, my department chair, Dr. Michael Reedy is here. There he is. There's Dr. Michael Reedy, who's an expert on the history of mountaineering, mountain science and mountains. And so I put this uh, slide in there. Um, Ehlers and others um, are credited with the, the first summit of Granite Peak, the highest peak in Montana in 1923. Um, there's a picture of Savinac Nursery. 
Koch was someone who was a builder in his mind. You know, he was someone who enjoyed nature. He was about fruit. He was about planting things and um, uh, fostering um, nature. Um, but things began to change for him. One of the key turning points for Ehlers were the Great Fires of 1910. And the Great Fires of 1910 swept across the Idaho Panhandle, Western Montana. It was a very hot, dry summer. Things had been happening on the land. Um, Three million acres burned. At least 85 people died at that event. And this tipped the Forest Service at that moment. It inclined it in a certain direction. Up until that point, there had been a debate going on um, between people who said the land needs light burning. The land needs fire. Native Americans had burned the land, rural people, ranchers, even some educated people, engineers and so forth said, you know, the landscape needs fire. And they called it light burning. Those who dismissed it ridiculed it as high unit forestry, um, associating burning the land like burning with Native American savagery. Um, there were others who were saying, no, we need to suppress those fires. Fires need to be suppressed, they need to be excluded. You just had this big blow up. Um, we need to stop those fires. We need to exclude, suppress, make sure they're all out. Partly what was informing that point of view was the ways that the Great Fires of 1910 and other conflagrations in that period had happened. Um, you had the appearance of railroads. You had the industrialization of logging through the use of steam engines um, that were had attached to winches, cables, chokers, and they dragged these logs through the forest. They yard them up with a steam donkey. And that really intensified the ability of, of timber companies to get out the cut. They left behind huge piles of slash, branches, bark, stumps, tops, all this stuff. All this stuff's lying over lying on the ground. Um, and of course, locomotives, um, eventually, you know, they would burn coal, oil, et cetera, but they're burning, they're burning wood as fuel. And, and those locomotives are throwing sparks. And you got homesteaders out there and they want to clear the land and they're starting little fires to clear off all that slash, they called it. And in uh, 1910, dry year, winds come up, all those little fires start to combine and you got a firestorm. And so the foresters who argued for suppression were thinking that 1910 and after in the context of large corporations and their industrial operations. So it wasn't simply their idea that they were going to control nature. There was like, implicit in that, their intrinsic to that was this idea that these giant corporations, monopolies, they were out of control. So the Forest Service went toward a policy of suppression, even though that there was evidence that the land needed fire. Not everyone in the Forest Service, not everyone in the land agencies, not everyone who studied land and fire totally gave up on the idea of light burning, as, as it was called. Uh, various places where that idea lived on. But the Forest Service, it turned towards all-out suppression. And it intensified over time. In 1935, in 1935, um, the new chief of the Forest Service, Ferdinand Sir Silcox, um, issued what was called the 10 a.m. policy. And the 10 a.m. policy is really interesting. Um, the 10 a.m. policy, Chief Silcox said that if there is a fire on a national forest, the goal is to put it out, to extinguish it by 10 a.m. the following morning. And the reason they choose 10 a.m. is that's, um, that's before solar radiation heats up the land and the fuels. Um, one o'clock to five o'clock generally is the critical burn period, as it's called now. Um, even today, one o'clock to five o'clock is when most wildland firefighters die. So the idea was to get those fires out by late morning before the critical burn period. And if that objective failed, you reset the clock 10 a.m. the next morning. And that idea 
the Tinian policy applied to every forest, no matter the place, no matter the type, no matter the species, no matter the ecology. It was a standardized template in, superimposed on an incredible range of topography and ecology. A really hugely important moment. It's these kind of things that um, bothered um, Ehlers Koch. He also began to question um, the Forest Service's evolving extraction policies. Um, extraction and the need for it, the scale of it, intensified in the Great War, the First World War. The need to get out timber for the war effort, for the Allied war effort. And uh, Koch, um, as the 1920s wore on, um, what he saw was um, a scale of extraction that he didn't agree with. Um, he saw a scale of extraction of timber that reminded him of the scale of extraction of ore from the earth. And there were moments where he lightened this kind of mass extraction of timber with the mass extraction associated with mining areas like Butte. Um, he was very concerned about this. Um, he, uh, he also began to um, think, he began to question what the Forest Service was doing. And there was a concept current at the time. It's actually very simple forest economics. Um, he thought about something that they called the indirect return. What's the indirect return on the forests? And there were areas in the national forests that had timber that um, was below market value at the time. But Koch and other foresters believed that if the Forest Service cared for those stands, eventually they would meet market value and they could be cut. In, in a lot of ways, what Koch and other foresters were thinking was that the national forests were hedged against the failures of capitalism market failure, and the National Forest could backstop that. While he's thinking this, he's also thinking, you know, um, there's other kinds of indirect return. It's not just timber with a kind of latent future economic value. It's also areas of the forest that really will never produce merchantable timber, but have other values. And one of those values, he started to think, was what today we would call wilderness. Those places are wonderful for people to go into, um, to camp, fish, hunt, hike, horseback, all this stuff. That's part of the indirect return of the forest too. So Koch was increasingly alarmed about what he was seeing. Um, the break point for him came in 1934 um, with a fire on the Selway River in Idaho. 1934, and what Koch witnessed um, really disturbed him. And you know, this was a seasoned firefighter. I mean, he was committed to firefighting and he was really, really good at it. Um, but the Forest Service at this time, 1934, had two things that it didn't have never had before. One of the things that it had was um, a large labor force, disciplined labor force, in the form of Civilian Conservation Corps crews. The second thing that the Forest Service had that it had never had before, which is really great for suppressing a fire, bulldozers. So CCC crews and bulldozers, Forest Service now had its hands on these things. And the fossil fuels, gasoline, diesel, um, that ran those bulldozers. And if you've ever seen a bulldozer on a wildland fire clanking along, there's nothing better for knocking out a fire. It's amazing what a bulldozer and a skilled bulldozer operator can do to stop a fire. The Forest Service poured these resources into the Selway drainage area. And Koch was aghast at what happened. Um, he said that the, 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 the value, the cost of pouring in men and machines into that area vastly exceeded the merchantable value of the timber in that place. He said, you drove bulldozers over the low, low trail. You wrecked a good deal of Native American culture and history. 
1935, he published an article in the Journal of Forestry, The Passing of the Lolo Trail. How much time do I have, Dan? Five minutes. I think I got enough. <laughs> okay. So this was his moment, you know. Um, let me just read to you a little bit of this. It's an impassioned piece of writing. Um, the Lolo Trail is no more, he lamented in an anguished, courageous essay, The Passing of the Lolo Trail. The bulldozer blade has ripped out the hoof tracks of Chief Joseph's ponies and obliterated a rich human history from Nez Perce and Blackfeet peoples down to the earliest forest rangers. It is gone, and in its place there is only the print of the automobile tire in the dust. No more will travelers and their horses see a land as the earliest people saw it. The trucks roll by on the new Forest Service road, and the old camps are no more than a place to store spare barrels of gasoline. The development had been cumulative, and now signs of it were everywhere. The hammer rings in the CCC camp on the remotest waters of the Selway. The bulldozer snorts on Running Creek, that once limit of the back of the beyond. The moose at Elk Summit lift their heads from the lily pads to gaze on the passing motor truck. If only he could turn the clock back, Koch grieved to what the subway had been even a few years before. Alas, it is too late. Roads are such final and irretrievable facts. And he thought that this was a disaster, a catastrophe for the US Forest Service agency that he otherwise loved. He was, uh, the Journal of Forestry published an essay by another Forest Service official, Earl Loveridge. And Loveridge had more words far less eloquent uh, in an effort to refute what Koch said. And if you read Loveridge's essay, his refutation of Koch, you can see implicit in what Loveridge is saying is a very modern notion that humanity can literally control nature, that fire, in fact, actually can be obliterated from the public lands, um, that, that, that if you don't stop those fires, there's going to be erosion and it's going to silt up the dams on the Snake River. Um, that if you have these fires, it's going to cloud the skies and it's going to interfere with commercial air traffic. Yeah, said Leverage. The fires, absolutely, once and for all, can be stamped out. It seems preposterous to, to us today, but that's what you believe. Two minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> so... Um, keeping in mind what uh, Kirby said to us, you know, to, the point is to understand, um, not to judge good or bad. Looking for saints and sinners in history doesn't do us a lot of good. But let me contrast Koch with a couple of other people, one of which is this guy, Kurt Dubois. Kurt Dubois was a forest manager, U.S. Forest Service, a contemporary of Koch's. Um, and he was a very different kind of individual. Um, he developed the first systematic plan. It's like a, a machine. It's like a blueprint for suppressing fire. He developed a plan for policing the national forests, which is not how Koch saw the national forests and the role of the U.S. Forest Service. Um, du Bois wrote a memoir, Trailblazers, um, in which he spoke of people of color, Chinese people, in deeply racist terms. Um, Koch never did that. Peter Koch told me that never did he hear his grandfather render judgment on a human being based on that person's race or religion, only on that person's willingness to do work. William Glenn Sloan, who was an um, engineer with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, MSU class of 1910, he was one of the architects of the Pick Sloan, Pick Sloan plan for the development of the Missouri River. Um, uh, this um, plan, um, was judged um, by um, the Native American scholar and activist Vine Deloria Jr. to be one of the worst U.S. government policies meted out on the tribes in American history. A series of dams and reservoirs that inundated the peoples that lived on the Missouri River. Koch, as far as I know, didn't have anything to say about this, but he definitely was opposed to that kind of giantism, that kind of bigness. Koch leaves us a legacy today. Uh, he died in 1954. Uh, he was an ill man. He was in pain. You can see some of that pain and his exhaustion on his face. His beloved wife, Gerda, had passed away from cancer. One of his sons had died in Normandy. Um, and in 1954, he took his own life. Um, a very familiar story 
um, that you probably are aware of um, happens to lots of Montanans. But I think he's left us a legacy of a courageous individual who stood up against and questioned the kind of things that still occur in our world. The idea that you can control nature, the idea that you can extract mass quantities of whatever it is from the earth, um, that there are areas that can be sacrificed zones for that extraction and so forth. Um, so what I think is happening is um, a reconsideration of Ehlers Koch and how what he stood for speaks to us today. Thank you.